the need here is to explain uh, the benefit of accumulating merit and the focus that one should take in perhaps a much more dynamic and meaningful way. Uh, because we're hooked by that kind of energy, we really uh, need to feel as though we can sink our teeth into something. With adults, there's generally a couple of different ways that they could go with their spiritual practice. And unfortunately, we tend to go on the less meaningful route, the one that produces the least potency and the one that is the easiest to accomplish. That is the route that we generally take. Because as adults, uh, as, as sentient beings, according to the Buddha, all of us wish to be happy. That is our common denominator. We all wish to be happy. That is the one thing that we have in common. You know, as human beings, the fact that we have two legs and two arms gives us some, and one head gives us something else in common. But the one thing that we have with, in common with all sentient beings, including any life form that you could possibly imagine existing, animals or anything, is that all sentient beings, all sentient beings, our common denominator is that we wish to be happy. Different animals express, different beings express it differently according to their capacity. Animals one way, other sentient beings another way. It's just according to their capacity. But we have that in common. And so we tend to want to stay comfortable because we mistake comfort for happiness. The Buddha teaches us that we all want to be happy but we do not understand how to be happy. A good example of this would be uh, a very rambunctious dog. Let's use the example of animals, since the kids have put animals into my, minds, into my mind at this point. <clears throat> and since I have a new puppy. <laughs> Think of a very rambunctious dog, a very young dog. Have you ever had a, a young puppy that will jump up on you and jump up on you and jump up on you and chew on you and annoy you and slobber you and generally drive you crazy? And each time they do that, you push them away, you push them away, you're trying to train them not to do that. But it seems like the dog doesn't have the sense to, to, to get the big picture immediately. It takes some time and some maturity on the dog's part and some skill and communication between the dog and the human before the dog backs off and gets the big picture and some of them clearly never do and so in often the dog will keep coming at you and keep coming at you and as an adult or as a person you'll keep pushing it away and pushing it away and pushing it away why does that happen the dog wants to be happy and the dog feels this instinctive and reflexive uh, craving to be happy by getting your approval your attention and your love. Isn't that right? Isn't that what the dog's trying to do? It's trying to get your attention. It's trying to get your love. It wants you to be f touching it and feeling it and feeding it and take caring, taking care of it. It's a very simple reflex. It's what the dog wants. And the dog thinks that is going to bring it happiness. But the human isn't doing that. The human is pushing the dog away. They're pushing the dog away. No, don't bite. No, get down. No. And so the, do the dog's not connecting. The dog still comes at the human. But he's, is the dog getting its happiness that way? Is it successful? Is the dog's technique successful? It's not successful because the dog is getting repeatedly rejected. You see what I'm saying? The dog cannot at this point understand that if it would back off and understand the human's instructions and be more sensitive to the human's way of operating that there would be a more meaningful and, and more happy interaction between the two of them. The dog's activity is very reflexive. Well, we're the same way. I mean, true, we don't jump up on each other's laps and chew each other's shoes. This is true. But we, do, we act in the same way. We act in a very reflexive, very automatic, very instinctive way. We constantly try to get love. We try to get approval. And we try to stay comfortable. We don't think things through, just like the dog. The dog's trying to get comfortable. It's trying to get in the human's lap. It's trying to get played with. It's trying to get comfortable in its natural comfort zone. It's not standing back and saying, now what would really work here? What would really work here? You see what I'm saying? And as humans, neither do we do that. We think instinctively, you know, how can I get comfortable? How can I relax? How can I feel good? How can I make my feel? How can I get some instant gratification? Just like on TV, all things should be 
made happy and content and peaceful and accomplished within 30 minutes. Just like the sitcoms. Everything's got to be worked out in 30 minutes. So we think about instant gratification. But we don't back off and get the big picture. We don't temporarily stress ourselves out like the dog would have to stress itself out by backing off and paying attention. We don't temporarily stress ourselves out in order to put out the proper effort and accomplish what needs to be accomplished. That's actually ha very much how we act generally and on the spiritual path. But first of all, in order to change that, you must understand your motivation. Your motivation is that you want to be happy. You want to be happy, and according to the Buddha, not only do you want to be happy, but you do not know what actually makes happiness up. You do not understand how to create happiness. This is true. The perfect example, of course, would be that if in our lives we feel as though we are kind of lonely, you know, kind of lonely and we don't have enough friendship and no one really loves us, we don't have enough approval, we don't feel good about ourselves, that kind of syndrome. We've all felt that, haven't we? We've all had that kind of thing happen to us. And so our immediate response to that is to try to get somebody's attention, isn't it? Try to get somebody's attention, try to, try to get some affection, try to make somebody that we're with pay attention to us, love us, notice us, or if not, try to find somebody that will. Try to do some sort of self-love trip, something like that. That's what we do. Now, the Buddha would teach us that in that case, that's the wrong thing to do, actually. It seems as though that's the right thing to do. That's the automatic, reflexive thing to do. That's instinct, tells us to do that. But the Buddha teaches us that's actually the wrong thing to do. That actually perpetuates the problem. You know, the, the Buddha teaches us that the thing to do instead, if we are feeling that kind of lonely self-absorption, we should look, that, look at that lonely self-absorption as being a result rather than a problem in itself, but a result of a previous cause. And that previous cause was probably selfishness. So if there was in a previous time, whether it be this life or some previous time, some kind of selfishness, the result of that selfishness will of course be that no one in this time is really willing to give to us. It simply doesn't happen. Cause and result. Apple seeds result in apple trees. It's just that simple. And so if we have that kind of thing happening in our life now, the Buddha advises us to not go for instant gratification but rather to adapt the attitude of kindness, generosity, develop the attitude of flowing out toward others. That that instead is the antidote to our own loneliness and our own feeling of isolation and our own feeling that uh, no one loves us and is giving us the necessary approval and caring that we require. The Buddha teaches us that is the proper antidote. But that's not what we do. Why? Because we, don't, we aren't really able, we don't have the technology to stop and think it through. And then once we even have the technology to stop and th think it through, there's a sense of courage. Courage, how to postpone the temporary gratification, how to, how to take a stand. It's still so habitually the case, so easy to fall into the trap of saying, well, I need a little love, I need a little love, I'll get a little love. You know, or Need a little, I'm a little hungry, I'll get a little food, that kind of thing. It's just so habitual and so easy. It takes a, a certain degree of courage to just say, enough is enough, this isn't working. Kind of take yourself by the scruff of the neck and say, whoa, let's think this through. So it is that kind of courage and purposefulness and knowledge, wisdom, technology, that we seem to be lacking. And what happens in our practice, as well as in our ordinary life, that we just keep moving through time, acting reflexively and reactively. You know, we're just constantly reacting, constantly moving through time. Now, in our spiritual practice, that is death. That kind of posture is death it will result in a kind of spiritual death. And somewhere down the spiritual path, as we travel, 
If we just move through it in that kind of unconscious, reactive way, we will find ourselves going dry, feeling spiritually impotent, becoming slothful. And then, as we continue, due to that great discomfort, we will actually lose interest. Actually lose interest. We'll not be able to maintain our activity. Just literally go dry. When I teach students, I take probably, if you compare my activity, my method to other teachers' method, um, I would say that, that I take a much more aggressive posture with my students. It's an in fact, I'm extremely aggressive with them. Um, when, I, when I see a student in a, at a point where they're able to make some progress, where they're really moving, where there's some, some movement there, some, some energy, I get very much in their face, very much involved with them. I'm, right, I'm really right there with them. I, I try to really give the input that I can give. When, on the other hand, a student isn't capable of movement, when there's a real stagnation there, if I feel that I can't be of benefit, I tend to back off because I don't want to waste my time. Oh, if I thought that I could help move through that stagnation, I would do it, definitely. If I, if I caught any whiff of an opportunity, I would do that, definitely. But what do I do with those students that are, move, that are ready to move forward, that want to move forward, that, that have gotten my attention and I can see that there's fertile ground there, what do I do with them? I try to set them on fire. I try to shake them to the core, to the bone. I feel that what I do is to cultivate them like the most precious fertile ground in, in the world, as though I had at my command this really precious fertile valley with all the nutrients in the soil and the soil being soft and pure and, 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 and yielding, you see, yielding. And, and in that soil, I'm going to throw as much seed, as much fertilizing power as I possibly can. Do you see what I'm saying? There's going, something's going to be happening there. It's going to be happening. It's going to be moving. There's potency there. Why? Why do I want to grow so much? Why do I want to take advantage of this fertile valley? Clearly, because I want to feed the world. I want the benefit to be big. I want all sentient beings to benefit. I want to use it. I want to grow it. Can't you see that? There's a fire there that has to be brought forth. There's a need that must be satisfied. Sentient beings are revolving in cyclic existence and they are helpless until they are able to touch and taste the means by which they can be free. Your dog can't do that. Your dog doesn't have that power. And that doesn't only occur to dogs. With dogs, many sentient beings are moving through their lives as though they were dead, asleep, moving from birthday to birthday, wedding to funeral, marking calendars. surviving. So when there is a ripe valley, I become extremely excited. Extremely excited. Now, each and every one of us has the opportunity to set our own pace. I mean, if you're, if you're in a very passive kind of mode, if, if, you, if, you're, if your natural personality trait would be to kind of kick back, 
or just take it as it comes, you know, roll with the punches or go with the flow or whatever people that eat avocados do, I don't know. Whatever that stuff is. <laughs> whatever that is. If you, if you feel in that mode, if you go in that way, you might be listening to me and saying, gee, I wish I was like that. I wish she'd invest a lot in me. I wish, I wish you'd pay a little attention to me. I wish that could happen. I wish, and you might go on with the litany of powerlessness, you know, the litany of impotence that so many of us recite how many times a day, don't we? This, this litany that we dupe ourselves with every single day. Or even if you, you didn't have that kind of relationship with me, you might say, gee, I wish a miracle was happening in my life. Gosh, wonder why it's not. Well, I'll tell you why it's not. Because you have the spiritual limp phenomena. <laughs> I mean, you, you have, you're just you're dead on the vine. You're not in a point of power. You, where's your power? Is it in the past? I mean, examine yourself. If you're in that kind of mode, what are you thinking? Gee, I think, I uh, hope I have enough power in the past or virtue in the past to help me on the spiritual path now. Well, gosh, I hope there's enough. <laughs> do, do you, do, don't you do that? Don't you see that? Don't you, like, look at yourself spiritually and say, wonder what I've got in my dusty ditty bag. You know? Or you look into the future and say, well, gosh, maybe someday in the future if I'm, if I'm a real good girl, something might happen. Oh, it might, don't you think? You know, I mean, that's the kind of posture that we take. It's, it sounds funny, it sounds silly, the way I'm putting it out to you, but don't you recognize that in your mind? That kind of stupid idiot hopefulness for the future? That kind of Gee, maybe someday the blessing will come. Huh. Or, you know, you think about the past and you think, gosh, maybe I have some good karma that's going to ripen soon. <laughs> do, you, do you recognize yourself? Don't you recognize yourself in that? It's so impotent. What are you going to do with that? That's nothing. Where's your power? Think about it. Think about it. Pull yourself, t pull yourself together. <laughs> Think about it. Where's your power? One thing I can tell you is the point of power is always in the present moment. You cannot bring anything from the past. You cannot, s cannot suck anything back from the future. Your point of power is in the present moment. The present moment is where time and space meet. It's where you are in terms of linear progression. Yes, of course, there is no time. Let's get real cerebral about this. Yes, of course, there is no time. Yes, of course, we are the primordial wisdom nature. Yeah, 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 I've heard all that. But the problem is that right now you are experiencing yourself in linear time as you now. And there's nothing you can do to negate that except deny your power. Until you're enlightened, that's your experience. So where's your experience is going to come through your experience. What's the difference between you and your experience? There's no difference. You see? The point of power is in the present, time and space grid. That, that is where it's at. And so you, as a spiritual person <clears throat> who wishes to travel on the path, you have to actualize your moment. You have to be here now, present in your moment. You can't be doing like the spiritual equivalent of kind of limpness. Held together with what? A lick and a promise? What's that? It's a useless method. Stupid. Are you so silly as to believe that things are just going to naturally work out because someone's written a script like on TV? 
I mean, when you listen to a 30-minute program on TV, you know that unless it's a real avant-garde kind of program, in which case they'll solve the whatever problem has been presented in three episodes rather than two or one, you know that at the end of 30 minutes, there's going to be some resolution and you're going to walk away with a pretty picture. Do you think that's what's happening in your life? Then, of course, you have to actualize yourself. What is required is potency. Where's the potency? And let me tell you where the, first of all, to describe where potency is, let me tell you where impotence is. Impotence is like this. I feel, I think, I react. It seems like this to me. This affects me this way. That's impotence. Can you hear the impotence in that? I'm over here being silly putty. SP are my initials. <laughs> and everything in my environment shapes me. So, <clears throat> I mean, basically, you're in the position where if somebody pressed you on a comic strip, you'd come out with a picture on your head. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> Deeply impressionable. <laughs> That's where you're at. And, and that's a, a, it's impotence. It's impotence. It's nothing. Literally, silly putty could do what you're doing spiritually. That feeling of, oh, yeah, I guess I'll wait and see what ripens. Well, sort of. In that posture, where are your brains? Well, if you have any, I don't know, but... In that posture, where are your thoughts? Where is your consciousness? What, what, what's happening here? You're in ten directions. There's no laser beam, you know? There's no laser. There's no force. There's no energy. You're not going forward. You're not moving. Do you see what I'm saying? Can you feel it, what I'm talking about? You're not moving forward. You're in ten directions, and just like, wait, you know, you can feel it on all sides because you're deeply intuitive and impressionable <laughs> and it's just coming to you and everything kind of like that and what's happening is you you don't have you're not you're not in go you're not in move you're not in progress you're not in yes mode there's no creativity there's no purpose, there's no fire, there's no passion. You're dead. You're like an inanimate object. Really. And of course, at that point, you kindly, being the kind person that you are that doesn't wish to suffer, you dupe yourself by saying, well, I'm kind of interested in this, and kind of interested in this, and I really like that stuff back there, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Well, where are you? There's nobody home. That's impotence. I'm trying to describe it not in a very academic way, but in a feeling way that you can relate to it. And you can say, oh, yeah, I felt like that yesterday and today and now, my whole life, maybe. Yeah, I recognize that pattern. You know, get it from feeling so that you can really recognize yourself doing that. Then, we need to talk about potence, potency. For me, this is what I know about potency. Potency is a posture of yes. Potency is a posture of direction. Potency is a posture of accomplishment. Potency is a posture of mission. And what I have found in my own life, and I'm explaining this from my point of view, because I feel that I'm most like you in, in the sense of being a Western person or what have you, a, a modern person. From my point of view, if I sat around worrying about how I felt and how things were affecting me and just how I feel and 
gee, I really like to do this, and this feels real good to me, so I'll do this for a while. I would think I would die. I think I would just disintegrate spiritually and mentally and become a blob, you know, a silly putty mental phenomena. I feel that what I must do instead is to gather together my energies and make my life a force, a movement. In my life, I have completely dedicated myself to benefiting sentient beings, to offer them the means by which they can also move forward like a laser. I feel like I have dedicated my life to the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings, as I have understood it. I want to be relentless in bringing the, the understanding, the light, you know, the path or whatever to others, to bringing them an opportunity to accumulate virtue and merit, to creating a place of refuge for all sentient beings. That's my purpose. And I feel very much on fire with that. And there's a vitality and a life and a yes and a movement and a power and a laser that happens with that, an energy. You see what I'm saying? There's an energy with that. There's potency, power, power. Not personal power, ego power, like, I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. <laughs> you know, not like your mother wears combat boots, which in fact I did have a pair of those once, but I gave them up. Not like, you know, <coughs> ego stuff. Not like, hey, I'm a heavy hitter, watch me. It's not like that. It's go, it's yes. It's nothing about self. That's the point. That's the point. The impotence that I'm talking about is like, I feel this and I feel that and I'm this and I'm that. You know, it's like, who cares? I mean, who really cares when you get down to it? Is it going to change the world because you have an impression? Because your face has a comic strip all over it? I mean, you know. Based on the needs of sentient beings, I want to be in go mode. I want to be on fire. Now, then I, then I met up with the Buddha's teachings, and what does the Buddha say? Very same thing. Well, he says it in different words. He says that what you ought to do is to examine the faults of cyclic existence, and based on that, get a plan. <clears throat> get a technology. Move forward. Take action. Look. Sentient beings are suffering. Some of them are dying. Some of them are getting old. Some of them are sick. Some of them are repressed. Some of them are hurting. Some of them are enslaved. Some of them are lonely. Some of them are crazy. Some of them are animals. Some of them are hungry ghosts. And based on that, you get a plan. What's the antidote? Spiritual potency, move forward, get the big picture. In terms of technology, the technology is available, there's no question. You want to antidote poverty and the suffering of poverty? Practice extraordinary generosity, not only ordinary generosity like money, food, stuff like that to poor people, but the extraordinary generosity of dedicating your life to the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings, period. All sentient beings that kind of generosity, and really doing it, being on fire with it. That kind of generosity. You want to <clears throat> antidote sickness? Then do what you can to support the life force, the healing, the long life, the happiness of other sentient beings. That actually increases your life force. And on the other hand, what cuts short our life force is hurting, damaging, or killing others. So, I mean, there's a technology. That part's simple. Get a plan. But the point of power is in the present. One must have courage. One must be alive. One must be on fire. One has to take the, comp the, the posture of accomplishment, moving, moving. Wake the mind up, you know, wake it up. A sense of urgency. 
But that urgency can only really be based on looking around and seeing that sentient beings are suffering now. They're not suffering next Tuesday. They're suffering now. So you want to act now, not on Tuesday. Now it's true that what I'm saying now is a very energetic thing, and it's like a shot in the arm, isn't it? Kind of like taking speed or amphetamines. We're all thinking, yeah, she's right. Let's get it together. Come on, what's the problem here? Let's get the corn cobs out of our behinds and move forward. Yes, I can see that. So we all get excited because I'm talking in this way, and my energy is very forceful, isn't it? <clears throat> what's going what's to keep you pulled together when you're not listening to me do this rag on you like this? What's going to keep you together? For me, I'll tell you what works. I'm not always like this. Sometimes I'm kind of lazy. Sometimes I'm kind of sleepy. Sometimes I want to go to see a movie or something like that. I want somebody to entertain me for a little while and not put out so much. Sure, absolutely. I'm like that too. But do you know what keeps me on track? What really pulls me back? What makes it happen again and again and again? You do. You and all sentient beings, because I've made it my practice to really study the condition of sentient beings. Having studied the condition of sentient beings, I can see that they require whatever help I can give. Whatever they require, whatever, it's not an ego thing. They require whatever help you can give. I don't know what you're waiting for. In cyclic existence, sentient beings are suffering. There is no doubt about that in my mind. You, all you have to do is read the paper. Have you read the paper? Read the paper. I mean, it is shocking to me that some people don't get that yet. They don't really get that yet. Did you know that? There was a man came here uh, last week. He said he kind of liked things the way they were. In a world with AIDS, in a world with war, in a world where in, peop in Bombay people are dying on the streets, lepers are walking around without limbs, in that world, this world, this is acceptable to you? When people oppress one another, when things are wrong, when you're facing your own death someday, not having known how to make the best of your life? That's okay with you? How can that be okay? How can that be acceptable? And that is the weight that must pull you straight as an arrow on your practice. These conditions are perpetuating themselves today not in the future when you think you might be able to move forward spiritually, hopefully if your karma in the past finally ripens. That's happening now. Believe me when I tell you the causes for our discomfort are ripening now. So if I were you, I would be ripening the causes of our progress. Now. In the present moment. Pull yourself together. Get your energies going. Get your priorities going. Make sense of it. Think. For some of you, that's not like your personality. And that's, I understand, different people are going to express it differently. But each of you has a passion. Do you, did you know that about yourself? Each of you has a passion. You have a passion. Even if you don't think that you're a passionate person. You know how I know that? Because you're here. In order to be here, you have had to have had desire to be here. In order to be surviving from moment to moment, you have to have the passion of survival. Now why don't you take that kind of stupid knee-jerk reaction passion and transform it into something that is meaningful for you. Take a hold of yourself for the sake of sentient beings. and allow them to be your reason for living. 
It's a good reason. I think that in closing, I think that when we do that, sometimes we're afraid that we'll get lost in the shuffle. If I let you be my reason for living, who's going to love me? Well, in the big picture, who really cares? I mean, really? Is that like a big issue or what? I mean, I just have this feeling it's going to work out. <laughs> you know? Tell you what, tell you what. I make a deal with you. I make no really. Let's make a deal. Can we make a deal? Okay, we'll do this. This is real smart. Now watch this. If you lay down your life in order to accomplish benefiting sentient beings and make your life a perfect vehicle of compassion, I will love you. Okay? Then you're handled. Got it? Anyway, Please take this to heart. Don't be dying on the vine. Use the visualization. Think about a grape on the vine. Just sort of... You know what grapes look like after they dry up? They're not a pretty sight. You ever seen that? A little flies get all over them, you know? Those little fruit flies. And their skin cracks and they get all... You want that to happen to you? Get those flies away from you. Think about yourself as a vital, vital force, spiritual, forward. Move it. Use that image for their sake. So thank you very much for coming today, and I hope that you will take it to heart, because if you don't take it to heart, that was just, you know, an hour's worth of inexpensive entertainment. <laughs> no, no.